Hey guys, we're back again. I'm Gene Delisala, President of Audioholics. And I'm Hugo Rivera, Vice President of Marketing. Gene, today, let's go ahead and discuss this topic that I want to mention right now. Topic is room EQ correction, because with all the receiver videos we're putting out there, a lot of people are asking us, you know, what do we do about the room EQ autocorrection? Do we use it? Is it good? And uh -huh. I think uh, I think we have some uh, solid knowledge to go ahead and uh, send out there. Yeah, you know, it's a good topic because it is a nebulous topic. You know, you don't really know what these systems are doing, and people just think a one button solution is going to solve all their problems. Mm -hmm. It's going to fix world hunger and climate change, and <laughs> you know, unfortunately, <laughs> things don't always work out that yeah. way. You know, we don't have the ability always to control everything with a push of a button like they do in Star Trek. Most things are not black and white, unfortunately. That's the yeah. problem. You know, I think it's interesting to, to give like a little historical perspective on this first. You know, you think back, go back to the early days of audio. We're time traveling. Time traveling back, even before you and I were around. But I remember the old receivers, they had the bass and treble controls, they had the, yeah. su the super bass control. Yeah, right? I remember those. Oh man, people wanted that super bass control. I, I will put it all the way up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what do you do when you put it up? What, what, I didn't, what we didn't realize when we were kids, yeah, you get more bass at low volumes, but you start putting that up at high volume, you're eating up amplifier power, okay? And I will blow up a few speakers too. Yeah, and that's the other thing too. So, you know, you start manipulating the tone on, on the speaker and, and, you know, it's fun because you like to customize everybody. Initially, you like a little bit of a colored sound. I, mm -hmm. think, I think people gravitate towards more of the boom and sizzle initially, mm -hmm. especially to an untrained listener. Mm -hmm. So it's a selling point. Well, as we evolved, you know, we got past the tone controls. We were told that that's dirty. You don't want to use tone controls. Don't touch that. You want to do it in the digital domain. You know, you want to do it without, you know, having all the different group delay issues and everything else. So you got PEQ filters, GEQ filters. We started doing the manual calibrations. Well, then it went to a step further where we are now, and now they're doing these auto cals or mm -hmm. auto room EQ. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's, they're supposed to do several things. It's not just about the equalization, but it's about speaker setup. Okay, right. so when you get like a system like Yamaha's YPOW, Denon has Odyssey, Mm -hmm. uh, Pioneer has the MCAAC, it's kind of a weird acronym. And you know, they all have their own different flavor and um, they all have pros and cons and we'll do a separate video on that as well. But here's the basic crux of what they're supposed to do. Number one, they're supposed to identify the speakers in your system. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to say you got a left front, right front, center, you know, it's supposed to identify all the channels. They usually get that right. Then they check phase to make sure your speakers are wired in phase. Mixed bag sometimes on that because sometimes in a three-way system you want to wire um, one of the drivers out of phase electrically to get an acoustic summation that's correct. Mm -hmm. The systems will incorrectly identify them as out of phase. So you got to be careful with that. Always check the polarity of your speaker cables before you believe in a biblical source, source like Room EQ. <laughs> These are not biblical sources, pe uh, people. Sorry about that. So after you check phase, then it checks distance. Mm -hmm. And usually they get pretty good with distance. You know, sometimes with the subwoofer, they could be a little bit off because some subwoofers have DSPs in them. And in actuality, if you think your sub is 12 feet away and it comes up with 15 feet away, you might want to trust the room EQ because it's probably accounting for that group delay that the processing in the sub is doing. Got it. Okay, so after it does the delay, then it checks level. Mm -hmm. And again, it does the levels pretty good. It does the chirps like kind of how a bat does sonar and it right. finds out, you know, it, it sets all that up. Um, you know, so for level and for delay, I think it's pretty good. For crossover, sometimes it, some of them do base management, some just completely ignore it. You know, I think Odyssey is probably one of the better ones at that. Mm -hmm. I've, I've played around with the Pioneer, Yamaha and Odyssey and I found that usually Odyssey is a little bit more sophisticated than the others. But um, with the, when it comes to base management, here's the problem with base management it'll sometimes cor incorrectly identify a speaker as large if it's close to a boundary. Oh. So you get a bookshelf speaker, you put it on, you mount it to a wall like a surround speaker, you get a boost gain from the boundary, and all of a sudden it, it identifies it as a large speaker, or it sets it up to a crossover point that's too low, like 40 hertz or something, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. So I always go back, and I, after I'm done with the room EQ, I always go back, I check the delays, I check the levels, I check the phase, 
always check the bass management. Usually a good rule of thumb is you always want to set it for 80 hertz. Okay. THX had that right, man. 80 hertz is usually a good crossover point because 80 hertz and below, the frequencies are non-directional. Right. And 80 hertz and above, you take a lot of the strain off the little speakers that can't produce the bass, give, you, give your uh, amplifier more headroom, and you dump that bass into the subwoofer channel where it should be. And you get more consistent bass as a result. But now for EQ is what you really want to know yeah, about. Correct. And uh, there's two schools of thoughts here. There's one school, the scientific guys at Harman, for example, like Dr. Floyd Tool, they claim you shouldn't do room correction above the room's transition frequency. So in a small room, like a theater room, the transition frequency is a couple of hundred hertz. Mm -hmm. okay? Then you got the EQ guys. They want to EQ everything. They want to EQ every speaker. They want to do whatever tweak they can. And you know you have to wonder who's correct and who's wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of I like to be kind of in the middle usually, but I have to say that the science leans more towards the guys like Dr. Floyd Tool, right. because they've been looking at this stuff for years, man. Mm -hmm. These guys know their stuff. They have their own system called Sound Film Management that doesn't EQ above the room transition frequency, and it's pretty spectacular what it does for bass. And the reason why you typically don't want to EQ above the room transition frequency is. High frequencies are extremely directional, mm -hmm. okay? A microphone can't really interact the way our ears do. We don't hear like a microphone. No. So, you know, you might EQ one point in space, but then two inches over, it's completely different. Right, right. The other problem, and you can relate to this, I'm sure, is these microphones are, or the systems, I should say, are assuming certain parameters about the speakers without knowing the parameters. They don't know the anechoic data of the speaker. They're measuring the speaker in the room. They don't know much about the room acoustics in, in general. So they're measuring it as a complete system. Now the better way, and nobody's doing this yet to my knowledge, is to get the anechoic data, the spinorama data mm -hmm. of the speaker, know all the parameters of the speaker, the off axis, everything, then measure the speaker in the room, then do a comparison of the two to know what to correct. You know what, Gene, that's, that's interesting. And I think, it's an engineering problem across yeah. the board because when you start making assumptions that really play an impact in the results, then you end up with the worst results possible. Correct. And a, a good example, I'll tell you this story real quick, is there's this little thing called an impedance uh, body fat percentage measure measurement uh, device. I, don't I remember know. those. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead, you go to the gym, right? And they're yeah. like, oh, we're going to test your body fat. And then you're holding this impedance device that goes ahead and just <laughs> measures, you know, how your how, how, how much time it takes for a signal to go from this hand to the other. Right. The problem, Gene, is that it doesn't account for muscle mass. So guys like us go, who go ahead and train with weight and have a little bit more muscle than others, guess what? It, uh, it assumes that all that stuff is body fat so therefore your body fat percentage is like completely way off you end up depressed after you go and then you can't get a good life insurance policy because they think you're overweight <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i completely agree yeah. yes yeah exactly. so i mean yeah it's very similar you know the room correction stuff it, it it tends to make too many assumptions and i am not a fan when room correction stuff does boosts because what happens when you boost certain frequencies just like that tone control, you turn that bass all the way up, mm -hmm. you're wasting amplifier power and yeah, you're you potentially are. damaging a speaker. Oh yeah. And then the other thing that it could do is it could create resonances in the speakers that didn't exist before the correction. Yeah. And I've heard it before. I've run systems, room corrections, and then I put on a DVD audio disc and all of a sudden I hear like a, you know, like a mm -hmm. resonance in the tweeter, even at low volume, it wasn't like the tweeter was being overloaded. It was some weird thing that the room correction system was doing that wasn't there when the room correction was turned off. Right. So, you know, I'm kind of at the point where if you have a really good speaker system that's very linear, that measures well, that's built well, you need very little room correction above the transition frequency with it. Room corrections is kind of a band-aid fix for poor speakers in a poor room. Mm -hmm. Because I've set them up. I've set them up, my, my parents have a big Florida room with vaulted ceilings, mm -hmm. all in-wall speakers. I used Odyssey in there, and they have good speakers. I set them up with good speakers, but it, the room is so sucky mm -hmm. that the room, uh, the room EQ actually helped it, and I thought it sounded better. But then if you take a really good speaker system in this room that's mm -hmm. acoustically controlled, you can get mixed results, and, and you sure. know you really don't necessarily need it at all if you've got good speakers. Right, right. I'd rather okay. focus on the bass frequencies. Mm -hmm. I'd rather get the positioning of the subs, multiple subs, correctly, 
and then do an EQ at the low frequencies because the low frequencies are omnidirectional right. and the bass doesn't vary quite as drastically from seat to seat so you can make assumptions and you could do some cuts mm -hmm. to the bumps mm -hmm. and get rid of some of those bumps and make it smoother and make it more linear and make right. it get rid of the boom basically right but in my opinion eq is should be used sparingly it shouldn't be something that you just go crazy with like you remember those yeah those v curves on the uh on the equalizers oh, that people I had with all the lights the 20 band eqs i had them <laughs> yeah yeah that's well that's awesome advice gene I think that pretty much uh, covers that, unless there's an anything else you want to add. No, I think we should do several videos on this topic. I think, you know, this is a general overview, but we'll get more in depth on some of the EQ systems that we've run, and uh, we'll continue from there. Awesome. Well, with that said, Gene, I will go ahead and ask our uh, viewers to just go ahead and hit subscribe button up here so that uh, they can also receive our videos via um, email, okay? Because YouTube is nice enough to go ahead and email our videos to the subscribers. Nice. So that's pretty good. And then also subscribe to our newsletter, uh, which uh, we send at least once a week, okay? And finally, be sure to share the wealth. Go ahead and share this video with all your friends and click the thumbs up below. Until next time, keep, keep listening. listening.